everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. We are so grateful to be here with so many friends and partners as we announce our next major initiative. We'll be investing in basic science research with the goal of curing disease. As a doctor, this is something I've been thinking about for a while. In fact, the last time I was in this room was in 2008, and Sam Hawgood gave me my first white coat. Since this is the first time we've gathered to talk about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, I'd like to take a step back and talk about how we think about our work. One year ago, my, our daughter Max was born, and we launched the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative with the goal of dramatically improving the lives of all of those in Max's generation. Our mission is ambitious, advancing human potential and promoting equality. We want to dramatically improve every life in Max's generation and make sure it, we don't miss a single soul. We reach every individual. We asked ourselves, in our children's lifetime, is it possible for them to learn a hundred times what we do today? Can we ease the suffering of many by curing, preventing, or managing all diseases that affect us now? These are big questions, and they're incredibly personal for me. I'm the daughter of Chinese Vietnamese refugees. My parents didn't come to this country with much, and they tried their best to navigate this world. My mother, who's here, worked... <laughs> She worked long hours at multiple jobs to make sure that my sisters and I had the best opportunities possible. My family believed in education, but didn't understand the school systems. So they trusted our teachers with my sister and my's future. Those teachers instilled in me a passion for learning, and particularly in science. I brought that to life by designing my own science classes and uh, being on the robotics team. I have to tell you, robots changed my life way before it was cool to even think about a robot changing your life. That love of learning carried me to Harvard, where I realized that something incredibly special had happened. As a child of refugees and first generation to go to college, I had ended up in a place with incredible, seemingly limitless opportunity, and that wasn't available to everyone else. There, I would study neurobiology, Spanish, and eventually attend medical school. Realizing that I was incredibly lucky to be where I was sparked and continues to drive me to ensure that others, regardless of background, can have their opportunity to reach their dreams and their full potential. In college, I led an after-school program very close to where I'd grown up. Our official job was to help the kids with their homework. But in reality, we did whatever we needed to do to give those kids a chance to thrive. Those kids were the soul of my college experience. One day, a school counselor came to me looking for a student that had missed several days of school. I hadn't seen her either, but I agreed to go help find that student uh, and see what was happening. After program that day, I stepped out and went to the playground and found her immediately. I saw why she hadn't been to school. Her two front teeth were broken, and she was ashamed to be seen. My heart and mind were flooded with questions. What had happened to her? Was she hurt? Were her teeth infected? What could have I have done to prevent this? That last question crushed me. It, the question is simple, simple, but the answer is so complex that I had no tools to tackle. That question drove me to medical school to help expand my toolbox of skills to help children, all children, thrive. Over time, my work as an educator and as a pediatrician has led me to think bigger about what's possible what can we do to enable Max and every child in her generation 
to exceed all of our dreams of what we currently think is possible. We began tackling the mission of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, advancing human potential and promoting equality through education. Mark and I immersed ourselves in the world of education, learning from the best minds and the experts on the front lines of how we could best make an impact for every child to become passionate about learning and to learn more than we ever thought possible. After six years of learning and iterating, we believe that personalized learning can help us reach that goal. Personalized learning recognizes that children all have different needs, academic, physical and emotional well-being, learning styles and interests. By building new tools and systems, we can give students ownership over their learning, access to resources that really resonate with them, and opportunities to see their learning come to life. At the primary school, we're doing that for the early childhood and elementary world, integrating health, development, and parental support. As of yesterday, we're now serving more than 100 families. In the middle school and high school world, we're helping build a number of school models and tools to help children build their core knowledge and skills in a way that best suits them. Summit Public Schools is a great example of this. As of this fall, they're serving more than 20,000 students in over 100 schools nationwide. And outside of the traditional classroom, we're investing in companies like Baijus that's giving 250,000 students access to incredibly high quality materials to augment their in-school learning. Now, Max is too young for all of this right now. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> She's 10 months old and the pediatrician's in the room. I'm very concerned. She's not making her M sounds yet. So, Mark and I spent a lot of time talking about M Max and M -M Mama and M Mark Dad. We believe in the power of personalized learning and that we can uniquely contribute by supporting leaders in building modern tools to help teachers and learners reach that vision. We're looking forward to sh sharing more in the future. So that's what we've been up to. But today, we're gonna talk about our next initiative, curing diseases. As a pediatrician, I have worked with families at their most difficult moments of their lives. From making a devastating diagnosis of leukemia to sharing with a family that we were unable to resuscitate their child. In those moments and in many others, we are at the limit of what we understand about the human body and disease, the science behind medicine, the limit of our ability to alleviate suffering. We want to push back that boundary. By investing in science today, we hope to build a future in which all of our children can live long and rewarding lives. When we decided to tackle this second focus area, we started asking questions. Mark and I spent the past two years talking to scientists ranging from Nobel Prize laureates to graduate students. We've learned a lot, and we know that we have a lot more to learn. We believe that the future we all want for our children is possible. We set a goal. Can we all together work to cure, prevent, or manage all disease within our children's lifetime? That doesn't mean that no one will ever get sick, but it does mean our children and their children should get sick a lot less. And when they do, we should be able to detect or treat it, or at least manage it as an ongoing condition. Mark and, I, Mark and I believe that this is possible within our children's lifetime. As we talk to a lot of top scientists, we realize that they do too. Of course, we can't do this alone, so today we're partnering with scientists, doctors, engineers, and universities to achieve this goal. Our aim is to bring together teams of innovative scientists and engineers to build transformational tools 
that unlock a new era of accelerated progress in science and health. For this initiative, we'll be investing more than $3 billion over the next decade to achieve our collective mission. Great efforts take great leaders, and today we're pleased to welcome Dr. Corey Bargman as the incoming leader of Chan Zuckerberg Science. Thank you for joining us here today. We are so grateful to be here with so many friends and partners as we announce our next major initiative. We'll be investing in basic science research with the goal of curing disease. As a doctor, this is something I've been thinking about for a while. In fact, the last time I was in this room, was in 2008, and Sam Hawgood gave me my first white coat. <laughs> Since this is the first time we've gathered to talk about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, I'd like to take a step back and talk about how we think about our work. One year ago, my, our daughter Max was born, and we launched the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative with the goal of dramatically improving the lives of all of those in Max's generation. Our mission is ambitious, advancing human potential and promoting equality. We want to dramatically improve every life in Max's generation and make sure it, we don't miss a single soul. We reach every individual. We asked ourselves, in our children's lifetime, is it possible for them to learn a hundred times what we do today? Can we ease the suffering of many by curing, preventing, or managing all diseases that affect us now? These are big questions, and they're incredibly personal for me. I'm the daughter of Chinese Vietnamese refugees. My parents didn't come to this country with much, and they tried their best to navigate this world. My mother, who's here, worked... <laughs> She worked long hours at multiple jobs to make sure that my sisters and I had the best opportunities possible. My family believed in education, but didn't understand the school systems. So they trusted our teachers with my sister and my's future. Those teachers instilled in me a passion for learning, and particularly in science. I brought that to life by designing my own science classes and uh, being on the robotics team. I have to tell you, robots changed my life way before it was cool to even think about a robot changing your life. That love of learning carried me to Harvard, where I realized that something incredibly special had happened. As a child of refugees and first generation to go to college, I had ended up in a place with incredible, seemingly limitless opportunity, and that wasn't available to everyone else. There, I would study neurobiology, Spanish, and eventually attend medical school. Realizing that I was incredibly lucky to be where I was sparked and continues to drive me to ensure that others, regardless of background, can have their opportunity to reach their dreams and their full potential. In college, I led an after-school program very close to where I'd grown up. Our official job 
was to help the kids with their homework. But in reality, we did whatever we needed to do to give those kids a chance to thrive. Those kids were the soul of my college experience. One day, a school counselor came to me looking for a student that had missed several days of school. I hadn't seen her either, but I agreed to go help find that student uh, and see what was happening. After program that day, I stepped out and went to the playground and found her immediately. I saw why she hadn't been to school. Her two front teeth were broken, and she was ashamed to be seen. My heart and mind were flooded with questions. What had happened to her? Was she hurt? Were her teeth infected? What could have I have done to prevent this? That last question crushed me. It, the question is simple, simple, but the answer is so complex that I had no tools to tackle. That question drove me to medical school to help expand my toolbox of skills to help children, all children, thrive. Over time, my work as an educator and as a pediatrician has led me to think bigger about what's possible, what can we do to enable Max and every child in her generation to exceed all of our dreams of what we currently think is possible. We began tackling the mission of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, advancing human potential and promoting equality through education. Mark and I immersed ourselves in the world of education, learning from the best minds and the experts on the front lines of how we could best make an impact for every child to become passionate about learning and to learn more than we ever thought possible. After six years of learning and iterating, we believe that personalized learning can help us reach that goal. Personalized learning recognizes that children all have different needs, academic, physical and emotional well-being, learning styles and interests. By building new tools and systems, we can give students ownership over their learning, access to resources that really resonate with them, and opportunities to see their learning come to life. At the primary school, we're doing that for the early childhood and elementary world, integrating health, development, and parental support. As of yesterday, we're now serving more than 100 families. In the middle school and high school world, we're helping build a number of school models and tools to help children build their core knowledge and skills in a way that best suits them. Summit Public Schools is a great example of this. As of this fall, they're serving more than 20,000 students in over 100 schools nationwide. And outside of the traditional classroom, we're investing in companies like Baijus that's giving 250,000 students access to incredibly high quality materials to augment their in-school learning. Now, Max is too young for all of this right now. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> she's 10 months old, and the pediatrician's in the room. I'm very concerned. She's not making her M sounds yet. So, Mark and I spent a lot of time talking about M Max and M Mama and M Mark Dad. We believe in the power of personalized learning and that we can uniquely contribute by supporting leaders in building modern tools to help teachers and learners reach that vision. We're looking forward to sh sharing more in the future. So that's what we've been up to. But today, we're gonna talk about our next initiative, curing diseases. As a pediatrician, I have worked with families at their most difficult moments of their lives. From making a devastating diagnosis of leukemia to sharing with a family that we were unable to resuscitate their child. In those moments and at many others, we are at the limit of what we understand about the human body and disease, the science behind medicine, the limit of our ability to alleviate suffering. We want to push back that boundary.
By investing in science today, we hope to build a future in which all of our children can live long and rewarding lives. When we decided to tackle this second focus area, we started asking questions. Mark and I spent the past two years talking to scientists ranging from Nobel Prize laureates to graduate students. We've learned a lot, and we know that we have a lot more to learn. We believe that the future we all want for our children is possible. We set a goal. Can we all together work to cure, prevent, or manage all disease within our children's lifetime? That doesn't mean that no one will ever get sick, but it does mean our children and their children should get sick a lot less. And when they do, we should be able to detect or treat it, or at least manage it as an ongoing condition. Mark and, I, Mark and I believe that this is possible within our children's lifetime. As we talk to a lot of top scientists, we realize that they do too. Of course, we can't do this alone, so today we're partnering with scientists, doctors, engineers, and universities to achieve this goal. Our aim is to bring together teams of innovative scientists and engineers to build transformational tools that unlock a new era of accelerated progress in science and health. For this initiative, we'll be investing more than $3 billion over the next decade to achieve our collective mission. Great efforts take great leaders, and today we're pleased to welcome Dr. Corey Bargman as the incoming leader of Chan Zuckerberg Science. Those of you not in science may not know Corey yet, but scientists in this room just got really excited. Corey Bargman is a legitimate rock star. She is one of the world's most respected neuroscientists and geneticists, and recently led the President's Brain Initiative. Corey's job will be to build out the strategy and partner with academia, biotech, and engineering to help realize this vision. We couldn't be more excited to have her leading this work. And Corey, Mark, and I are also excited to announce our first science investment, the Biohub. We're investing $600 million to bring together leading scientists from Stanford, Berkeley, and UCSF, along with a world-class engineering team, to help us develop new tools to understand and treat disease. The Biohub will be in a building just blocks away from where you're sitting right now. The Biohub will be led by Joe DeRisi, a biochemist known for his genomics approach to infectious disease, ranging from the deadliest form of malaria to a wide range of viruses and Steve Quake, a biophysicist and bioengineer who developed a number of measurement tools that help us better understand health, most notably replacing amniocentesis with a blood test. We're so excited to see what they'll accomplish at the Biohub with their focus on bringing scientists and engineers together to help build tools for the entire scientific community. We've met... <laughs> We've met some amazing people on this journey, and we're so thankful that so many leading scientists are joining us as advisors and partners in this new science initiative and for the Biohub. Tackling all disease is a big goal, and we're so excited to work with all of you to achieve it. Now I'll hand it off to Mark, my partner in all things, ranging from bath time to understanding science. I love her. <laughs> she is so inspiring. So inspiring. Before we get started, 
Uh, before I get started, I just want to thank all of you for coming out today. Um, I'm looking out and I see our family and you know, so many close friends uh, who have traveled from all across the country and a lot of people who we've worked with for many, many years. And I, I just want to say it's really meaningful to me and Priscilla that you're here with us. This is something that we've been working on for, uh, for a few years now and we're really excited to share it with all of you today. So thank you. When Max was born, we wrote this letter describing the hope that she gave us uh, for the future. And I know that that's a hope that so many of us here share, that we can make a better future for our children and for generations to come. Priscilla's a doctor. I'm an engineer. And I think that that hope is part of the engineering mindset. Right? It's this belief that you can take any system, no matter how complex, and make it much, much better than it is today. Whether it's code, hardware, biology, a company, an education system, a government, anything. You can make anything much, much better than it is today. So we look for opportunities to bring engineering to social change. Because there are lots of people who can invest capital and hard work, but when you can also build tools, uh, when you can empower people to go out in the world and make change for themselves, that's when the biggest change happens. And that's what we've done uh, with Facebook to help build a community of more than 1.7 billion people. Uh, that's what we're doing with internet.org uh, to help local entrepreneurs connect more than 30 million people to the internet. And it's what we're working on with personalized learning to help give teachers the tools to bring this, these new kind of tools to more than 100 different schools and to more than 20,000 students in just a couple of years of work. And that's how we hope to help scientists with this initiative as well. So that's our approach here. And that's why at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we are building a world-class engineering team to work on these problems. Now, when we went out, we started talking to a lot of folks in the scientific community. And we heard a few themes about how we could be most helpful. Uh, we could bring scientists and engineers together to work on uh, problems in new ways. Uh, we can build tools and technology that can empower the whole scientific community worldwide, not just right here. And we could help to grow a movement to fund more science, to make even more progress, and really turn this into a, a national mission. So those are the three things that we're going to talk about here today. Now, let's go to the big question. Can we cure, prevent, or manage all diseases in our children's lifetime? Or to be a bit more concrete, a child born today, right here, uh, has a life expectancy of right around the end of this century. So can we cure, prevent, uh, or manage all diseases by the end of this century? Now again, that doesn't mean that no one will ever get sick. But it does mean that people should get sick a lot less, and that when they do, we should be able to identify it quickly and treat it, or at least be able to manage it as a non-harmful ongoing condition. But this is a big goal. And you know, we thought that this was really aggressive when we got started. But we've spent the last few years uh, going out and talking to dozens and dozens of top scientists and experts who really believe that this is possible. So we dug in. And you know, we read everything that we can get our hands on. I, I got into the math of, of how uh, science is funded and organized. And, I got to work with Priscilla on this, which helped, because she's actually a doctor. And, um, and she studied neuroscience at Harvard, so she has a slight edge on me, slight edge. Uh, but you know, when, you, when you get into it, one of the first things that strikes you is that medicine has only been a modern science for about a century. Right, so think about that for a second. For thousands and thousands of years, we made very little progress on diseases, and then we started uh, treating, we start investigating diseases and applying the scientific method, and bam, project, uh, progress takes off. So since then, we've eradicated smallpox, thanks to some of the people in this room. Uh, we... <laughs> and, and we're close to eradicating polio, thanks to other people who are here with us today. We have vaccines to prevent meningitis, measles, and many forms of the flu. Uh, we have antibiotics 
that can treat potentially deadly diseases like tuberculosis and pneumonia. Uh, we've produced insulin to manage diabetes and statins to reduce heart disease and chemotherapies to treat many forms of cancer. We've reduced smoking through public education and epidemiology. And we've even found ways to reduce life-threatening diseases like HIV to conditions that we can manage on an ongoing basis. So all of this adds up to finding more and more ways to cure, prevent, and manage uh, more and more diseases over time. Now, one of my favorite facts in public health is that if you look back over the last century, uh, life expectancy has increased by about a quarter of a year per year. And it's actually been pretty linear, the, the progress. Uh, and this is due to advances in science and public health. So if we can only continue this trend through the end of this century, then by the end of the century, the average life expectancy will be right around 100, which implies that we will have found cures or ways to solve uh, most of the things that, that prevent the majority of people from reaching that age today. And you know, as science and technology accelerate, I'm personally pretty optimistic that we're going to be able to do a lot better than that. Now, today, most people die from only four kinds of diseases. That's heart disease, heart attacks, uh, infectious disease, cancers, and neurological disease, uh, like stroke or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And you know, of the rest, uh, almost half uh, die from things like accidents and injuries and hunger, which are not necessarily even diseases. So if the focus is on curing all diseases, um, it's pretty clear where you want to focus to start. Now, I really don't want to oversimplify this problem, uh, because in each of these categories, uh, there are many different diseases and conditions. And uh, so, for example, cancer, you know, every different cancer is a different disease. And it's unlikely that we're going to be able to find uh, many single breakthroughs that can knock out a whole category. But at the same time, there are definitely common strategies for addressing each disease, uh, each disease category, all the diseases in a given category. And uh, common tools and technology that we can develop to help see and understand and treat the diseases in each category. Throughout the history of science, most major scientific breakthroughs have been preceded by the invention of some new tool or technology that allows you to see and experiment in new ways. All right, so the telescope let us see planets and, and stars and uh, let us to be able to understand astronomy and the universe. Uh, the microscope. Let us see cells and bacteria and let us to be able to treat malaria and pneumonia uh, and opened up whole new fields of study. You know, more recently, DNA sequencing and now editing allows us to explore our genomes and more precisely fight cancers and a whole lot of different genetic disorders. Tools also create breakthroughs in how we treat diseases. So vaccines are a broadly applicable tool that we can now reuse uh, and build upon to treat and, uh, sorry, and prevent more and more different kinds of diseases over time. So you look at this, and it's actually pretty easy to imagine what new tools we need to develop to make progress on the four major disease categories that we just talked about. AI software to help with imaging the brain, which we really need to push our understanding of to make progress on neurological diseases, um, or machine learning to analyze large databases of cancer genomes, a chip to be able to diagnose uh, any infectious disease, uh, continuous bloodstream monitoring to be able to identify and catch any disease early, uh, or a map of all of the different kinds of cell types in our bodies and the different states that they could be in so that people who are designing drugs can reference that to quickly design something for any given disease that's out there. So these are the kinds of tools that we want to focus on building at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And more broadly, this focus on building tools suggests a roadmap for how we might go about curing, preventing, and managing all diseases this century. Because if we can help develop the new tools that allow us to see these, new, these categories of diseases in new ways and experiment, then we can empower scientists all around the world to make much faster progress and breakthroughs in these areas. <laughs> now, building tools requires new ways of funding and organizing science. 
Because when you look at it today, our current funding environment doesn't really incentivize that much tool development. Right? The, the typical scientific grant is a small grant of maybe a few hundred thousand dollars, which is uh, enough to pay a few scientists' salaries or maybe for part of a lab, but it's not enough to do serious tool development. Right? Because tools often take large groups of scientists and engineers working together over long periods of time. So this is a sketch of uh, one of the first internal combustion engines, which was a collaboration between many scientists and engineers over decades. And when this was created, it led to the invention of cars and planes and a lot of things that are staples of our modern society. But this was a large investment, a really large scale collaboration, and it took a long time horizon for this to happen. So this brings us back to our plan. Solving large problems requires bringing scientists and engineers together to work in new ways, to share data, to coordinate and collaborate. And you know, most science funding today goes to individuals working separately. So what we've heard is that there's a big opportunity for us to invest in projects that help to bring people together. <laughs> Tool development has always had a, a, a big part of engineering. And today, that increasingly means software engineering. But in today's funding environment, it is really hard to have a large group of world-class engineers, uh, like the kind that you'd find at a great technology company today, working on these kind of problems. And of course, that's exactly what's required for developing a lot of modern tools. So this is going to be one of the biggest focuses for us at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And we're also going to support long-term initiatives. Uh, because you know, I think we, we all know here that the biggest breakthroughs take many years. And we want to make sure that more scientists in the community have that long-term time horizon to be able to uh, pursue their ideas and, and work to prove that, that their ideas can, can work out over the long term. Now, we also want to help push for more science funding overall. Our society today spends 50 times more treating people who are sick than we spend trying to find cures so people don't get sick in the first place. We can do better than that. <laughs> you'd only invest that way if you believed that people were always going to get sick. Right? Then you'd try to treat people uh, as well as you could, and you'd just hope that science improves some things on the margin. That's what investing 50 times more in treating people than in trying to find cures looks like. But in a world where we can actually cure all diseases in our children's lifetime, our society should invest dramatically more in this. And there are so many opportunities for governments especially, but also uh, nonprofits and, and companies to invest more in science and curing diseases and to invest in tools to empower the whole scientific community worldwide to make more breakthroughs. So this is an area where public support really matters. Right? Because the more people who believe that we can cure all diseases in our children's lifetime, the more likely we are to get our governments to invest in it, and then the more likely it is to actually happen. So this is something that uh, we can all come together, and where we need your help, and it's an area where we can all do something really important together. Now, to summarize again, from all the conversations that we've had with, with dozens and dozens of, of scientists and experts in the community, there are three big opportunities that we want to go after. We want to help bring scientists and engineers together. There's a massive opportunity to do that, to work together in new ways. There's a huge opportunity to build tools and technology to empower not just the folks working here at the Biohub and in the Bay Area, but across the whole world. And there's a big opportunity to build a movement uh, to help fund more science around the world. So that's the plan. Thank you. Thank you. So this is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. 
In a minute, Corey is going to come up here, and she's going to talk about how we're building networks to work on these different kinds of diseases uh, around the world, like we're doing right here with the Biohub. And then right after that, Steve and Joe are going to come up and talk about the work that we're doing right here at the Biohub uh, in areas like infectious disease and a new tool called the Cell Atlas. Now, remember, this is going to be a long-term effort. Right? We're going to invest billions of dollars over many decades, but it's going to take years before the first tools get built, and then years after that before they're actually used to cure diseases. So we have to be patient. This is, this is hard stuff, but it's, uh, but it's important. And you know, I think that this is about the future that we all want for our children. Right? Because if there's even a chance that we can help to cure all diseases in our children's lifetime, that our children, or even their children, can live happier or healthier lives, then we're going to do our part. And together, we all have an opportunity to leave the world a much better place than we found it. So thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's really meaningful to me and Priscilla that you're here with us. And now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you world-renowned expert in neuroscience and genetics, the leader of Chan Zuckerberg Science, Dr. Corey Bargman. So it's very exciting to be standing here today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a geneticist and a neuroscientist. I've had the privilege of taking part in a spectacular era of biology, and I can't imagine a more thrilling experience. Science is one of the great accomplishments of humanity. It represents the efforts of many thousands of people working over hundreds of years who have built on each other's discoveries to learn about how the natural world works. It's fascinating. It's beautiful. And science is also useful. As a biologist, I've seen firsthand discoveries that have led to advances in human health. My scientific career started in cancer biology, not treating patients, but trying to understand what makes cancer cells different from other cells in the body. A discovery I, ma I made as, as a graduate student about an obscure rat cancer was one of many steps made by many people that ultimately led to the development of Herceptin, a drug used to treat human breast cancer. Herceptin was the first drug that was pointed like a laser at exactly the genetic changes that caused a cancer cell to grow. As a student bumbling along, I would never have believed that this would result in part from my work. But over the years, I've watched many scientific discoveries lead to medical progress, and I'm here to tell you today that it does happen. Basic science works. And that's important, because we have great unmet needs in medicine. In my own field of neuroscience, for example, there are far too many brain disorders for which we don't have any viable treatment. Disease is not just about death, it's about human suffering. Brain disorders like autism or schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease prevent people from living full lives in the time they have. They will affect someone in every family over the course of a lifetime. And the same goes for many chronic diseases. We need to do more. Priscilla and Mark, through Chan Zuckerberg Science, want to inspire and support the science that will allow us to cure, prevent, and manage all major diseases by the end of the century. That's a heart-stopping statement, and it should be. What does it take to make that a reality? Well, we're talking about curing, preventing, and managing diseases by the end of the century, 80 years from now. That means we can look at projects that will pay off in 20 years or in 50 years. To me, that long view is what makes Chan Zuckerberg's science initiative feasible. And that's why Mark and Priscilla's vision resonated with me and makes me want to make it a reality. Taking the long view, the scientific discoveries that have led to major medical progress have common themes. First, they're made by extraordinary people. 
Second, they're often spurred by advances in technology that allow a question to be asked in new ways. Third, the big advances usually involve people with different skills and backgrounds working on a common problem. These three pieces, people, technology, and collaboration, are the theory behind Chan Zuckerberg science. How does that theory look in practice? Well, we have a plan. We will build, bring different kinds of scientists together with engineers in new ways. We will build tools for everyone to empower the entire scientific community. And we will work to grow science and science funding so more science happens. Today, I will talk about those first two areas and give some specific examples of the kind of projects we're going to do. The biohub, transformative technologies, and challenge networks. Our first investment at Chan Zuckerberg Science is the Biohub, which we are also thrilled to announce today. The Biohub here at Mission Bay is a new partnership between three great universities that have not cooperated formally this way in the past. <laughs> Ever. At the Biohub, basic scientists, physician scientists, and engineers will develop new technology platforms and apply them to biology and medicine. It's being led by two exceptionally inventive people, a, a biologist, Joe DeRisi, and a physicist turned engineer, Steve Quake. Both have amazing accomplishments. Steve developed a prenatal blood test for learning if a fetus has Down syndrome without amniocentesis. And Joe has made important progress in studying diseases in the headlines, like the SARS virus, as well as long-standing diseases like malaria, which infects 200 million people worldwide. Steve and Joe will tell you more about the Biohub, which perfectly represents the principles we want to support scientists and engineers, transformative technology, and collaborating on important problems. The second piece of Chan Zuckerberg science is building tools to empower the entire scientific community, transformative technology. We are at a time of incredible opportunity right now with new computational tools like machine learning and new biological tools like genome editing and stem cells. At Chan Zuckerberg Science, we want to improve those tools, scale them up, and put them into as many hands as possible so that every scientist can do the best experiments. And we want critical mass, so we'll be working with external partners and with funding agencies around the country and around the world. For example, there's a growing interest in the scientific community in the idea of a cell atlas, a comprehensive resource with the locations, numbers, and molecular properties of all of the different cell types in the human body. We need this information to develop new understanding and cures for, areas, for diseases in all areas of medicine. We're going to advance these areas by supporting technology development at the Biohub, but also by supporting and collaborating with partner efforts throughout the scientific community. We have other projects in mind, like building our founders' unique insight into software engineering, into more sophisticated databases and data interrogation tools, and developing engineered human stem cells for studying the cell biology of every major human disease. And importantly, everything we develop, every tool, every piece of data, every cell line, will be available to all scientists everywhere. Yeah. The, the third piece of Chan Zuckerberg science is to support networks of external investigators with a common mission across the U.S. and eventually around the world who will work on important problems in a cooperative way. I think of them as virtual institutes. We're calling them challenge networks. Here's the idea and an example. An important unmet need in my field is better treatments and prevention for neurodegenerative disease. 
there's also an incredible opportunity for the first time. Because we know many genetic risk factors now for human diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's or ALS. But we don't know what these genes actually do to those brains. We don't even know half the time whether the gene is acting in the dying cell or in some bystander cell. So in the perfect world, we take the most insightful physicians and the deepest mechanistic cell biologists to dig into those risk factors and the cleverest engineers building miniature microscopes and solving pattern recognition problems in brain biopsies and tell them to talk to each other and learn from each other how to answer these questions. And that is the idea of a network, a group of 10 or 15 labs with different expertise working on a common challenging problem. Chan Zuckerberg Science will select the network members, support them, bring them together for physical meetings, and create communication systems so that they learn from each other as part of this virtual institute. I have to tell you, in the past few years, I've spent far too much time in hospitals with people I love. When I listen to their dedicated doctors, I've realized that there is so much that we don't understand and so much science that needs to be done. That's what we want the networks to build out. We envision networks that will be focused in some cases on individual diseases, in some cases on technology development, and in some cases on important biological areas that will pay off in the long term. Why neurons die in neurodegenerative disease? how viruses, bacteria, and parasites cause disease, how the immune system attacks viruses without attacking the body, how the chemistry, electricity, and wiring of the brain work together to generate thought and emotion. If you take great people and set them loose on important problems in an intelligent way and give them a long time horizon, there will be progress. We want people committed to the mission and to strong collaborative interactions. One component of that will be supporting a different career model where we fund highly qualified, hands-on working scientists and engineers working within the network labs and within the technologies and in the biohub, and we will build a reward and incentive system that encourages them to work together over the long term. We hope these scientists, early in their careers, will build a new culture of scientific collaboration. And this is really exciting to me. The importance of technology, the importance of collaboration, the need for new scientific mechanisms and career tracks, these are bottom-up ideas from the scientific community. They're already refined by discussions with many people, and they will be refined further. We're being guided by a spectacular scientific advisory board, and these are people who all have great accomplishments, both in science and in leadership. And several of them have come from around the world to join us this morning, and I could ask you to stand up. Um, but just to tell you who's going to be with us, it includes Art Levinson, Huda Zogby, Bob Tejan, David Haustler, Shirley Tillman, Tobias Bonhoeffer, and Harold Varmus. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for being here. And, and just to be really clear, at every point in Chan Zuckerberg Science, we will be asking expert scientists and engineers to help us identify the right projects, select the right people, and evaluate them going forward. In the Biohub, UCSF, Berkeley, and Stanford are our partners. They're taking a risk to do something they've never done before. Chan Zuckerberg Science will be looking for other partners for the transformative technology projects and for the challenge networks. That doesn't mean more physical biohubs. It means partner institutions and scientists who share our vision and are willing to take the risk of trying out new collaborative scientific models that bring together scientists and engineers, build tools, and reward people for working together across boundaries and institutions. So in summary, here's what we want to do. 
Find great people and support them. Let them work together on important problems and technologies. Give them a long time horizon. This will work. <laughs> and, <laughs> and with that, I would like to introduce the co-presidents of the BioHub, Steve Quake and Joe Derisi. And first up, Steve Quake from Stanford University. Thanks, Corey. Uh, and let me open by saying what a pleasure and an honor it is to be here today. My name is Steve Quake, and I'm a professor at Stanford University and co-president of the BioHub, along with my partner, Joe DeRisi, who you'll be hearing from shortly. The BioHub is dedicated to implementing the Jan Zuckerberg science mission from the perspective of technology development and scientific discovery. We've partnered with Stanford, UCSF, and Berkeley in order to support and harness the spectacular talent at those three institutions uh, in the service of developing new technologies which will help cure human disease. The BioHub is going to pursue large interdisciplinary problems, problems which can't be solved in conventional academic environments and do not fit in the government funding models. We're also going to provide support for individual faculty members at those three universities to pursue their riskiest and most ambitious ideas in order to help invent the next great generation of technologies. Finally, we're going to provide access to the technology platforms based on BioHub inventions to all the scientists and medical researchers of those institutions so they can be used to broadly advance the scientific and medical research uh, going on there. As you heard, we're going to have a very strong engineering paradigm, both internally at the BioHub and in the faculty that we support at the universities. And that's a unique and distinguishing aspect of our program and mission. Joe's going to go into more detail about our plans, and you'll hear about that in a few minutes. We're fortunate to be advised by some supremely accomplished uh, engineers, physicians, and scientists. And I want to take a moment to introduce you to some of them. Our external scientific advisory board includes Rick Lifton, president of Rockefeller University, and Sangeeta Bhatia, who's a distinguished professor of bioengineering at MIT. It also includes Bob Tijan, uh, former president of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and Don Ganim, who's the head of global infectious disease at Novartis. We've also got an internal advisory group with representatives from each of the three uh, participating universities, uh, and that includes Russ Altman from Stanford, Jennifer Downa from Berkeley, and Jonathan Weissman from UCSF. None of this would be possible without the support of uh, Mark and Priscilla. And on behalf of the entire scientific community, I'd like to thank them for their commitment and willingness to push the boundaries of science and technology. <laughs> They're clearly not afraid of risk or ambition, and it's wonderful to see that kind of trust in our plans. I'd also like to thank the university leadership, and in particular, John Hennessy and Sam Hawgood, who were both personally uh, deeply involved in much of the planning and who've also been willing to take risks. Uh, the BioHub is unlike anything the universities have done before, and both John and Sam have been very creative at figuring out how to design uh, a new sort of relationship between the BioHub and the universities. Joe and I will do our best to deliver on the promise of the BioHub, not just as a place to do great science, but also as a place that will change the way science is done. Let me tell you a bit about one of our first big projects, which is a cell atlas of the human body. The cell atlas will be a resource which comprehensively characterizes not only the many different cell types of the human body, but also provides a detailed architecture of the molecular interactions within each cell. We're going to bring several emerging technologies to bear on this problem. The single cell sequencing technologies developed by my group and others around the world, the power of genome editing, and high throughput microscopy, among others. It's amazing that nobody really knows how many different cell types there are in the human body. The textbooks give a number of about 300, but those of us working in the field all believe that there are substantially more. The Cell Atlas will not only answer this question, It'll also provide a detailed molecular characterization of each cell type. And the better we understand these cell types in health and disease, 
the better we'll be able to develop new therapies to treat and cure disease in areas ranging from cancer to diabetes to infection. This is a huge undertaking, and we anticipate our efforts will catalyze a global collaboration among many different groups and institutions to complete the Human Cell Atlas. Now, I'm pleased to introduce my partner in leading this endeavor, Joe DeRisi. Thanks, Steve. I am so stoked to be here. <laughs> I can't tell you. My name is Joe DeRisi. I'm a professor here at UCSF, and I'm incredibly fortunate and thrilled to tell you more about the Biohub. I'm a biochemist by training, and I actually have deep ties to both the University of California and Stanford. So it's natural we should join them together here in the Biohub. I'd like to follow up on Steve's overview of the Biohub with some additional details of what will actually go on there and how it will function. First and foremost, the Biohub will be a nexus of collaboration between these three great powerhouse universities, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and UCSF. And furthermore, the Biohub will actually have a physical presence. It's actually located at 499 Illinois, just a few hundred yards from where we are right now, next to the Benioff Children's Hospital. And that makes it easy access for the various UCSF campuses around the city, for UC Berkeley and for Stanford. Very strategically located. Next, I want to tell you what goes on in the Biohub. One of the things that I'm incredibly thrilled and excited to tell you about today, and something that's really near and dear to my heart, is the Investigator program. Beginning on October 3rd, faculty members from any of the three universities, from any discipline, at any career stage, through a simple web-based application, can apply for a Chan Zuckerberg investigatorship. What does that mean? That means a five-year term with a discretionary budget to pursue your most bold and innovative and risky ideas, things that normal grant-giving organizations would not normally support. Again, we want to emphasize any scientist from the three institutions in any field, and we especially are encouraging early investigators to apply. Beyond the investigator program, the Biohub will actually maintain and uh, establish a whole set of technological platforms inside the hub itself. These technological platforms will be the latest in technology, but we'll also have our own internal engineering team that's going to actually build the next generation of instruments and, uh, and technologies for the entire community to use, regardless of whether you're an investigator or not. Now, beyond the investigator program and the technology platforms that we're going to maintain there, I'd also like to tell you about the Biohub research projects. You heard a little bit from Steve and from Corey about the Cell Atlas project. That's going to really be an amazing project. There's another project that I'm going to tell you about today. It's entirely focused on infectious disease. Now, this is something really near and dear to my heart. This is what I work on. And they have four major components to this project. And they are, very simply, detect, respond, treat, and prevent. And this really follows about the way we think about tackling this problem. Let's cover the first one, detect. So this is something that I've been personally invested in for a long time. And what it means is our ability to detect comprehensively in an unbiased manner any infection from any tissue, anytime, anywhere. I really got my start in this over a decade ago when we uh, helped assist in the discovery of the SARS coronavirus. And that really made a huge impression on me. And since that time, we've been trying to push these methods as hard as we can. And I believe the technology and informatics are at the point now where we can drive unbiased, comprehensive diagnostic testing, even from things we haven't even discovered yet, into clinical practice. And while this has actually started already here, the Biohub will work to accelerate and drive these efforts through new tool development and software engineering. Next is respond. So you don't have to go too far out of the headlines to figure out why we're talking about this. This point is borne out of incredible frustration on the part of myself and my colleagues in the scientific community about our ability to respond quickly to newly emerging threats. This has been true certainly for the Zika virus, and it will be true for others too unless we do something about it. So while my colleagues here at UCSF 
and around the world are making solid progress trying to understand this particular virus and the tissues it attacks, the BioHub will actually maintain personnel, equipment, and resources in a manner that allows us to act very quickly when new threats emerge, wherever they emerge, and how they might emerge. There won't be any long debates about whether we should fund something or not if it's a clear threat. Treatment. Okay, knowing an infection is only the first part of the job. We have to address this critical problem that we have a dearth of medications for pathogens, especially viruses. And what the BioHub will do is will leverage advances in high content imaging and screening, as well as the Cell Atlas and CRISPR gene editing tools to better find, identify, exploit both host and pathogen targets for therapeutic interventions and help develop those with our partners around the world and in California especially. Now, the final one is prevent. So the ultimate arsenal in preventing infectious disease is actually immunity through vaccination. But it is also sobering, and it's very much the case, that many pathogens have eluded our ability to confer long-lasting protection. The BioHub will seek to understand the immune correlates of protection and to generate new avenues to actually create the next generation of life-saving vaccines. And I'm thrilled to tell you here today that our colleague down at Stanford, Peter Kim, has agreed to come up to the BioHub to help lead this effort. And he's no stranger to vaccine and therapeutic development. Uh, and he will be leading the charge on this initiative in general. It's going to be fascinating to work with him, and I'm really looking forward to it. So altogether, I believe that the BioHub is going to accomplish this mission of bringing the three institutions together to be able to work in a manner in a, in a style that they just simply haven't been a mechanism to do before. It's a bold new experiment. I'm pretty sure it's going to work. Better work. <laughs> and I'd like to thank the support of the universities that made this happen, and especially to Mark and Priscilla for their incredible vision and their dedication to this endeavor. This is the... <laughs> This adventure's just begun, just wait. Now, I'd like to call Mark out to the stage, and thank you very much. All right. You're awesome. Thanks so much. Thank All right. So thank you, Joe and Steve and, and Corey. Uh, that was a great summary of some of the work that we're going to be doing here. You guys are doing awesome work already. We're proud to work with you to advance this mission of uh, curing, preventing, and managing all diseases in our children's lifetimes. Uh, now, uh, before we wrap up, there are so many people who Priscilla and I uh, want to thank for helping to shape this initiative. Um, I want to start with our science advisors, right? The dozens of top scientists and experts who have spent hundreds of hours with us uh, shaping this. I mean, this is a lot of different ideas coming together uh, from a lot of different people, and this would not be possible without you. So thank you guys for, for that. And I want to especially call out a few people who have, who have really invested a lot of time in this. Um, Art Levinson has, has really helped to organize um, all of our discussions and pointed us in the direction of a lot of uh, the, the top folks and, and most fruitful conversations that we've had. So I want to thank Art. Um, uh, this is going to be a, a long list if we clap for everyone. Uh, but but, but we, it, they deserve it, so it's good. Um, uh, Eric Lander has been an advisor to us since the beginning of this and really has helped Priscilla and Corey and I brainstorm this idea of having a broad set of scientific networks to tackle diseases and really the BioHub idea here. So I want to thank Eric for, for that and all his help along the way. Uh, Bob Tejan, who, who's right here, who has encouraged us from the beginning 
uh, to focus on tool development. And probably the first five conversations we had, uh, you just give us all these examples of the different tools that you're building at Genelia Farms and, um, and inspired us to go in that direction. And, and Bob is going to be uh, the, the only member of the scientific community who is on the science boards for both the Chan Zuckerberg Science um, overall initiative and the Biohub. So thank you for continuing to play a special role in shaping this work. Um, Francis Collins, uh, the, the head of the NIH, um, really pushed us super hard to focus on computer science and what we could uniquely bring to this. And that really shaped our thinking and was a unique contribution. So I want to thank Francis for that. Um, Huda Zogby, uh, for her really honest and, and direct organizational feedback and thinking on how to structure organizations that do science research, um, super insightful and, and has been an invaluable advisor. So I want to call her out. Um, Rick Lifton, the, the new president at Rockefeller University, both for uh, spending time helping us map out what the Biohub was going to be early on and for so graciously lending us the time of uh, some of his key faculty members to, to come lead this initiative. Uh, thank you, Rick. And um, David Baltimore for, for his wisdom. Uh, and, and kind of encouraging us to explore uh, different scientific directions. Thank you, David. Um, Shirley Tillman for helping us explore neuroscience and, importantly, introducing us to Corey. <laughs> and, um, and, and one more, um, Yuri Milner, uh, our partner in investing in all kinds of different science for many years and someone who's really helped to shape our, our thinking. So thank you for all of our science advisors. Uh, now, that's only one group of the people I'm going to thank, though. So um, I, I also want to call out, um, on the philanthropy side, there's a group that has been particularly helpful, the Science Philanthropy um, Advisors. And if some of you guys today who are here uh, come away from this thinking that you want to help invest in science, um, Mark Kastner is the first person you should talk to. Mark, if you're here, can you stand up? He, he has been so helpful. And, and helping us think through this and as a resource and, and thinking through uh, how, how to do this kind of um, science philanthropy. So thank you. Now, of course, probably the biggest thanks go to uh, Chancellor Hawgood and President Hennessy. And your teams, of course, and, and Chancellor Dirks, and your teams at, at UCSF, uh, Stanford, and, and Berkeley. Um, you know, there were a few jokes about this, but for how great these universities are, it's been hard to have them work together. And it, it, it took um, a, a lot of leadership from, from these folks. And I especially want to thank John, because you know, his term as president just, just ended. And he ran so hard at this problem to make sure that all the hurdles were cleared out of the way uh, before his term ended. And that is something I will never forget. So thank you, John and <laughs> Chancellor Hoggood. Now, there are also uh, some community leaders who are here with us today whose support and, and our community here has been critical to getting this off the ground. So I want to thank the president of the University of California system, Janet Napolitano, um, <laughs> Mayor Lee, um, <laughs> Mayor Schaff, and Lieutenant Governor Newsom. Your, your continued support in helping to build the community and, and making this a place where we can invest and have the Biohub become hopefully one of the great uh, centers in the world for biomedical research um, has been extremely helpful, and we really appreciate it. Now, there's one more person who I want to thank and invite out here to share a few words. And this is someone who has been a role model for me uh, and a mentor for um, for decades, uh, both in building a technology company and engineering, and more recently in philanthropy. And you know, this is someone whose work in eradicating polio uh, and in uh, working on malaria really inspired me and Priscilla to believe that we could actually cure, help the community cure all diseases in our children's lifetime. So please join me in welcoming Bill Gates.
<laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, and uh, it's an honor to join you all uh, for this incredible milestone. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is already doing some very promising work in terms of improving education for all students, and so that's really a, th a thrilling thing. And it's amazing that today they're taking on another bold challenge, uh, this idea of curing and, and preventing all diseases by the end of the century. Uh, that's very bold, very ambitious, uh, and I can't think of a, a better partnership to take it on. Uh, Melinda and I have, have enjoyed getting to know Mark and Priscilla uh, over the last few years, uh, talking to them about kids and science and philanthropy and so many things. And what they bring to this is, is really kind of amazing. Uh, you've got Mark's risk-taking uh, entrepreneurial skills. You've got uh, her understanding as a pediatrician of, of the, the things that we really need to do. And they both love science, and they're both very committed to where it can take us. Uh, Melinda and I also believe in science, and, and we've seen some great progress uh, that these kinds of uh, investments have led to. Uh, long before uh, any of us came along, science had already done incredible things. For example, Rockefeller Foundation in agriculture. Uh, there's over a billion people living today because of what they did in uh, plant science. We have all the great people who worked on vaccines, and that's a big reason why uh, in 1990, over 12 million children died. And now, 25 years later, less than 6 million children die every year. Uh, and that's science at work. Uh, but we need more science. I remember during the Ebola epidemic, uh, Mark was in India and very concerned appropriately, you know, what we were going to do about this. And we talked about our frustration that the science investments to give us the uh, great diagnostics, the antivirals, the vaccines, they really weren't there. And if we'd had bad luck, that could have spread and, and killed tens of millions. And we're still at risk, uh, not only for that kind of epidemic, but flu and many others. And so we need science to go after those tools so that we can really be safe. On Saturday, I was up in Montreal, uh, which was a gathering to replenish the funding of uh, the Global Fund. The Global Fund uh, makes sure that medicines get out to people who need them for three diseases, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. And as people were coming, making those generous pledges, uh, they were all saying to me, can we end these diseases? Uh, you know, as generous as those donations were, uh, all they can do is hold the disease in check. They are not uh, going with the tools we have today. We cannot end those diseases. So only through science can we get an HIV vaccine or a malaria vaccine or a preventative tool that's so easy for men and women to use that we get uh, large-scale prevention. And so we desperately need this science. Uh, at our work at the foundation, it's always amazing to me what the world doesn't understand about some key issues like uh, prematurity. Why are, are, are some babies born early? Or even during the first 30 days, over a million child, children die of infection, sepsis, and we don't really know uh, how to stop that. As kids grow up, nutrition is very important. And we're realizing that the microbiome plays a very strong role there, but we don't know enough yet today to stop malnutrition, which holds back literally hundreds of, of millions of kids. And so science is needed, and it's a great time. I uh, heard a little bit today about uh, the amazing tools uh, that these scientists are using now, and uh, sequencing is part of that. I was in a meeting about liquid biopsy uh, last week where we were talking about detecting proteins at 10 to the minus 20th uh, at the, the zeta molar level, and how we can apply that to things like diarrhea and sepsis and really understand what's uh, going on there. And so it's a magical time to bring this group together to tackle these problems. Melinda and I uh, started our foundation 15 years ago, and 
The thing that's been the most fun for us is meeting other people who share our optimism and our uh, commitment that the, even these tough problems can be solved. And at the top of that list are, are Mark and Priscilla. Uh, their, uh, their vision, their generosity is really uh, inspiring a whole new genera generation of philanthropists who will do amazing things. Uh, in terms of amazing things, the goal we're talking about today is uh, one of the best. I'm so impressed with the team that's been pulled together here. I have no doubt uh, we'll make great progress on these diseases and literally not only save millions of lives, but make the world a more equitable place. So I think all of us will be uh, proud to say that we were here on the day that Mark and Priscilla started this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It's incredibly meaningful for Mark, myself, and this entire community uh, that you were here with us today. I also want to thank everyone for coming out and launching this brand new chapter of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to help the scientific community cure, prevent, or manage all disease within our children's lifetime. My heart is full of hope, and we are all eager to get started. It's an honor to be with you on this journey. Let's do this together. Thank you.